so thank you all for coming today, even though it's bright and early in the morning. Hopefully I won't send any of you to see the I'm up here. So my name is Alex Arkandakis. I'm one of the managing consultants of Pentest People. Um, I write for the British Computer Society Internet Specialist Group. I specialise in web applications, mobile security, API security, pretty much anything application related and on the web. Um, a particular interest of mine is studying the psychology of hacking and social engineering. This is sort of tricking humans, tricking people into believing things they shouldn't. Some forms of psychological manipulation in a way, but not as, as sort of deep as that sounds. Um, I'm a public speaker and workshop uh, facilitator, and I've spoken at B-Sides London, the SSI TSEC, ISACA CSX, and Securite, alongside another few small, um, small places. So to begin with, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm going to go through a few um, very easy to understand simple points. So here's an example of a server response header. On the internet, when we are browsing, we request a page, it then sends back a page from a server. Most of the time, uh, softwares that are used like IIS uh, and other server related softwares are, um, the software versions are not hidden by default which means that it's very easy for an attacker to find these software versions and research them, as we'll see in a moment. Here we have an example of a network scan on the underlying network layer, which is showing software versions as well. Two highlighted software versions are the IS 5.0 and then port 4.5 TCP, which we'll get into a little bit later. This was the port that was actually exploited in the WannaCry ransomware and <coughs> service. So once we found software versions, as a hacker, we'll go on to a um, site called CVE Details, typically. There are a few other ones that we use, but CVE Details is a massive database of known exploits so that we can research the versions. <laughs> as we can see here, the Microsoft 5.0 has two critical rates of vulnerabilities. These are both code execution or, and then the rest here are bypasses. So it's really simple for us to look into an application, find versions or look into a service, find versions and research them. But what about actual exploitation? ExploitDB is probably one of the main, app, main sites that we use for um, exploits. This is pre-written code that we can literally <coughs> download. Sometimes you need to compile it yourself. Sometimes it's completely plug and play or click and play. And in the terms of the port 445 TCP that we saw earlier, which was used in the WannaCry attacks, this is a snippet of the WannaCry ransomware. You can go on ExploitDB and you can download this ransomware and start sending it around. I don't advise that you do that, but the purpose of this is to show you it's not difficult. A lot of the time, hacking is as simple as finding a software version, researching for an exploit and finding something that someone else has made, firing and clicking it. This software, this exploit in particular, gives you system privileges remotely if the report is available remotely. Really simple, really easy to do. So brute force and multi-factor authentication. A brute force attack um, typically starts off by us researching a target. So prodding services. So we'll use a web application as an example. We'll go on and we'll test the registration function, the login function, and the forgotten password function. If we sign up to an application with a username that we know exists, we try signing up again, it tells us that this account is already valid in the database, then we know there's enumeration. You can then go onto your LinkedIn, for example, build a list of usernames judging by your LinkedIn, use these against the login portal or if you've got password function or the registration function, and we can look at the responses and build a valid list of usernames. Once we've done this, we can actually start attacking the password and trying to get authentication. So the proper brute force attack occurs when um, there is no lack, there's a lack of an account lockout policy or any kind of capture. Technically, it is only a matter of time and computing power until we successfully exploit any account that doesn't have a password lockout because it's just unlimited attempts until we get it. There are multiple types of brute force and you can get part, uh, dictionary based, which is using full words. And then you can get true brute force, which tries to every combination of every letter, starting like A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, so on and so forth, till we get to the end. Multi-factor authentication is becoming increasingly popular now. It is really important. Anything that has hardcore administrative um, sort of permissions or money-related permissions or you store card details in here, you should really be using multi-factor authentication for. MFA also needs to be treated like passwords, which it definitely is not. Just because it's sent to you in a text or you get it from a Google Authenticator app doesn't mean it's not a password. 
we recently had a phishing campaign for a massive pharmaceutical company and we compromised two of their directors uh, Office 365 accounts. We tried logging into these accounts and we were presented with a um, multi-factor authentication screen so we couldn't get through. So our challenge was to try and get these MFA codes. It gave two options. One was to send a push notification to the person's phone. The other was the one to send a text. So we called the first director and said, we just need to confirm your identity before we actually speak to you about these security related topics. We're just going to send a text to your phone. Can you read us the number? Send a text to their phone. They read us the number straight away and we were into the account. The second one, we used the same methodology, but we just sent a push notification. Both work with absolutely no problem and no problem whatsoever. So the purpose here is multi-factor authentication needs to be treated exactly the same way you have a password. Just because the code changes every 60 seconds or it changes every time it's messaged to you, it doesn't mean that you can just hand out your MFA codes. So brute force attacks are simple to set up and easy to execute. Only a matter of time and computing power until it's successfully exploited. To protect against this, you should implement a capture or some kind of account lockout policy. And if you can, implement multi-factor authentication. There are a lot of different types of multi-factor authentication that's available now, such as text messages, Google Authenticator. Another positive is that if you sign up to a site, let's say random.com, and they get, explore, they get hacked and they dump all of your username and password data in clear text somewhere. <laughs> If you're reusing a password, which the majority of people that are not in security do, I mean, half of our attacks are done by exploiting password reuse, or a good majority of them anyway. Um, even if your data is sold there, even if they do get into your account, they can't get past the second layer of security. So why people are not using multi-factor authentication more is completely beyond me. Um, it would actually mitigate a good majority of the, the internet-related vulnerabilities if everyone started implementing MFA. There are obviously problems with it as well. If you leave your phone at home, you can't log into your account. So weak passwords, we're gonna look at some common myths surrounding passwords. Take this with a little bit of a pinch of salt because these slides don't really differentiate the difference between the true brute forcing and the dictionary based. So here's an example of a typically weak password of password, which could be brute forced instantly. Um, so here's the rumor. Does, making, does using complexity on passwords make them stronger? So NCSC, NIST, pretty much all of the awarding body, all of the big bodies a long time ago were recommending using as many different characters and random things as possible that are difficult to guess. But they didn't really take into account the fact that computers don't work that way and they're not finding it difficult to guess, they're just trying everything. So yeah, it does make it a little bit stronger putting a four and O oh into there. It's gone from instantly to about a minute, which is quite a lot, but it's still not good enough and it's still not going to protect you against any of us when we're trying to hack you. Passphrases. So a passphrase is a lot easier to remember than a word with five hashtags and symbols, at symbols, exclamation marks. If we have three or four words that are added together with spaces, dashes, hashtags, whatever in between them. A lot easier for the human brain to remember potentially means um, for the CISOs in the room or, or, or the heads of department, you can um, stop your, you know, you can stop people having to change their password as often um, because they have much stronger, uh, much stronger passwords. So we recommend a minimum length of 10 characters for low privilege users and a minimum of 16 for high privileges. These are admins with a lot of privileges on your system, basically. So, Three words, spaces between them, about 454 billion years. Uh, even better, throw a little bit of complexity into the mix, and that's one quadrillion years. As I said, take it with a bit of a pinch of salt. This is a really good site called How Secure Is My Password. Um, it is completely client side, so if you type your password in there, it's not sending your data over to a server somewhere. If you don't believe it, like I didn't when I was looking at first, they're on GitHub and they're open source, so you can look at everything that they're actually doing. But the point here is that Using a long password with a load of random numbers and, and digits in it is difficult to remember and ineffective. Using a long passphrase with spaces or dashes or something separating the words is a lot better. And then just to stop dictionary based attacks, showing with a little bit of complexity in the pub as well. So we're going to have a little look at the threat landscape. So between 
October 2013 and May 2018, businesses lost about $12.5 billion from business email compromise, which we'll go into a little bit more in detail in a moment. 2015 saw the rise of ransomware with an increase of over 752%. Ransomware families jumped from 29 to 247. And I will update this because I think it's going to be a lot higher now. Business email compromise is a type of fraud whereby an attacker or a pen tester will spoof a chief executive officer, the chief operating officer, or CEXO, whatever, whatever sort of C-suite employee they want. They'll send an email to the finance director saying, hey, we have a really urgent matter here. If we don't pay this software license within the next 24 hours, we're going to lose it and we're going to lose millions of pounds using a sense of urgency to really try and press people into doing it. The average loss is around $140,000 and the owner AG lost $44.6 million in one attack. As we said before, 12.5 billion total loss between 2013 and 2018. I won't dig into ransomware too much because I know there's another talk about it, but ransomware is a form of extortion. Payload is typically delivered by an email. The user delivered, opens an email or clicks on a link to download something. It will encrypt all your files and demand, demand payment via anonymous cryptocurrency usually. Bitcoin's fairly anonymous, but there are some coins that are actually dedicated for anonymity. So what is spear phishing? Spear phishing targets specific individuals unlike regular phishing. Social media is used, instead of sending 50,000 emails, we're sending five or six, but they're targeted, we're researching you. We're looking at what are your interests, you know, um, is there a particular attack vector that looks really viable? We'll move into how we use social media a little bit more in a moment. The sender's email address will appear genuine and the payloads are usually technical or ransomware, as we said, psychological, hey, send this now, we have to get this done, we have to get this done, or um, sort of a request from a senior official, or either or both, so spoof password reset with keylogger. The motivation behind spear phishing is that it's easy to set up and execute, it doesn't take up much time and the rewards can be massive. So long gone are the days where a phishing email will be sent to 40,000 people trying to sell you dodgy Viagra or telling you that hot singles are waiting for you or something along those lines. It really doesn't happen that way anymore. Email filters and spam filters have got to a point now where they're very advanced. They're good at picking up that 40,000 of these dodgy emails are being sent. So now we're specifically using social media to target the individual and to make things that realistic. So say a C-suite employee goes on holiday and they take a picture of themselves on the beach with their hotel name in the background. As you do, you want to show off to everyone on holiday and you're having a great time. We go onto their Facebook, we find this picture and we can see that they have now developed what we'd call a trust relationship with the hotel. So we can start off by sending an email to the hotel asking a very generic question like, hi, do you have any gym facilities? They'll reply, we'll then be able to look at the language they use, we'll also be able to copy their email footer with pretty much no knowledge at all to copy and paste. If it's an HTML footer, a little bit more difficult, but it takes about half an hour maybe to spoof. We'll then send an email to the C-suite employee with a spoofed email and the same type of uh, text and footer from the hotel saying um, high value goods have been left in your room. Please can you click on these pictures to have a look to make sure they're not yours. And almost all the time people click on them, A, because they wanna know if they left anything expensive and B, because they're probably curious as to what expensive things could be left in a room. So a couple of facts and statistics. Two thirds of all malware arrives via email attachments. Um, malware is very, very popular these days. This is a massive figure. Sophisticated phishing emails facilitate 90% of successful cyber attacks. This statistic, I didn't believe myself, but it comes from the US Chamber of Commerce Cybersecurity. Um, I can send these slides out a bit later if anyone wants to fact check or look into anything. So 97% of people can't differentiate an authentic email from a well-crafted fake. Again, we're not talking about the dodgy Viagra emails. We're talking about spending a good day researching and finding out who a person is and how you'd attack them. Someone's particularly interested in football, or they go to a certain football club, we exploit that trust relationship. This one that I found interesting is 56% of email recipients and 40% of Facebook users clicked on a link from an unknown sender, even though they knew the risks, it's because they're curious. Humans are curious, we like clicking on things, we like finding out what's behind things. We like opening doors and clicking on a link is no different than opening a door in, in some senses. 
So we'll have a look at a quick case study where a hacker group called Carbonax sold over $1 billion in one attack and none of them have been caught to this day. To my knowledge, I think there may have been an arrest without any charges. So when you hear about jewellery heights, people get away with what, £4 million, £5 million, maybe a lot more. Typically caught very quickly, but Carbonac, can you raise your hand if you've heard of the Carbonac Captain Group? <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so we've got a couple of people in here. So Carbonac are barely even heard of, even in a cybersecurity room, because they're so subtle and they're so clever and they steal so much money. So they'd start their attack with spear phishing emails, you know, research the employees, send them out, manual recon of the network, including key loggers, any video footage from CCTV, and then they transfer large amounts of money out. So I've liberated this slide from Kaspersky, which were the original... Um, penetration testing company that were researching <laughs> this particular hack. So the infection started as a backdoor that was sent as an attachment. One bank employee downloads the attachment and then they send it to more. Eventually we have hundreds of machines infected, but we can't get any administrative accounts. Problem here is we need admin privileges to move through the network to get the money. So because one of these accounts were um, taken over, they sent an email to the admin or the administration or IT department asking them to come and log into their computer to have a quick look and see why it's being so slow. They came over, they logged into the computer, there's a key logger on the login, they now have admin credentials. They sat on the network for a couple of weeks watching people through their webcams and their computers, watching people through their CCTV, um, listening to people through microphones, basically building up any kind of knowledge of what they do on a day-to-day -day activities and how to copy them. They then transferred over a billion dollars in total through three, uh, four different types of um, sort of uh, exfiltration. So online banking, they were just donating money, to, uh, sorry, sending money between accounts, using e-payment systems, <laughs> inflating already existing account balances. When you've got domain admin, all you need to do is add a few zeros onto the end of someone's balance to give them more money, so it's not difficult. But my personal favorite is controlling ATMs. Uh, apparently this is not that difficult to do according to Kaspersky. Quite a few ATMs have a default key that you can go and buy online. When you open that up, you're presented with a USB slot, get the right malware which you can buy online for fairly cheap, shove it into the ATM and spill the money out to you. But Kaspersky, uh, sorry, uh, Carbonac were a little bit more advanced than this in that they, um, they controlled the ATMs to spit out cash at a certain time and then they sent what they'd call mules around to go and collect the cash and bring it back to them, basically. Um, which is just insane that it's so easy to hack ATMs. So, protecting yourself against spear phishing, take all of this with a bit of a pinch of salt. Don't share personal information through emails. Don't share personal information online. Don't put anything online that could build a trust relationship to you, which could be exploited by an attacker. If you receive a suspicious email, contact the sender. If you receive a link in an email from someone that you shouldn't be expecting, contact the sender. Don't contact the sender at the bottom of the footer because that's usually us. Um, we put our names, our details, and you'll phone one of our, a pen tester or you'll phone a hacker and we can just mimic the person, pretend to be the person. Report anything suspicious to your IT department. Um, those of you in IT here, which I'm guessing is the majority, will probably understand that you'd rather your staff were reporting every single email they thought was slightly suspicious and taking up your time than getting your systems infected with ransomware and costing you many sleepless nights <laughs> and a lot of pain. Don't click on any links. If you have any links and emails that you're not expecting, call the sender again. Call them through your work directory. Don't use the phone number at the bottom. Um, so we've got through that as quickly as possible. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, my tag is A. And we are currently hiring at Pentest people if anyone is interested on becoming either a junior or, or whatever level you are at Pentesting. Just give us a shout, apply here, and then we'd uh, be more than happy to have a chat with you. Um, I believe that we're taking questions afterwards. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 okay, cool. So I'll take any questions. We'll get everyone up in the camera and we can do that. Cool, perfect. Thank you very much. Cheers.